Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Good day and welcome back to the 40 Orty Podcast, the autism and mental health podcast. How are you guys doing today? I am feeling pretty chipper today. I've been having quite a hard week in terms of mental health as it as it usually goes, uh, but things seem to be doing quite well at the moment. And before we get into this episode, I do want to do a little bit of a pre precursor, a little bit of a disclaimer that we are going to be talking about something that is currently happening, something that's perhaps quite um, emotional for, for people or, or perhaps a little bit too too topical, <laughs> if, if you can say that. But we're going to be talking about the Ukrainian war, but we're not going to be talking about it in general or the way that um, most of the stories are covered. We're going to be talking about it specifically in the context of autism. So today I have my very lovely guest, Aaron, who's going to be um, giving us some updates on the work that he's been doing, as well as some of the co- some of the cool projects that he's currently working on. How are you doing today, Aaron? I'm very good. How are you, Thomas? It's uh, thank you for having me. It's a very good day. No, of course, of course. Um, I'm not. Yeah, not too, not too bad today. I'm feeling quite quite well. I. Uh, I'm currently having to do a lot of physio at the moment, which um, it's not the most fun thing to do. And, you know, sitting aside a couple of hours every day just to uh, torture your leg. (laughs) But um, I I recently had an ACL reconstruction surgery and I had like two of my ligaments replaced and some cartilage removed and stuff. So, um having to do a lot of physio actually from day one. So as soon as I got on my surgery, they got me up and I had to do a bunch of exercises and it was a very overloading day, but it's, it's passed and I'm feeling quite, quite, um, strong when it went up to about 70 kilos on the box squat. So it's, um, improvements are rolling in. Would you like to, uh, tell everybody a little bit about the, the sort of uh, the work that you're doing as far as like the military museum and how you got into it. What I do, I uh, just a little bit about what I do. I serve as the military specialist for Carlton County. That's in Woodstock, New Brunswick, Canada. Um, I am owner operator of Bauma Woodworks where I build military models from scratch. I'm a military historian for the area and I'm working on building a military museum. I'm, I'm an autistic advocate. I have autism myself and there has been what some of the work that I do. Um, I'm a scratch military modeler. I'm a woodworker, but I'm also um, a strong autism advocate. I was diagnosed with autism at age of three. Uh, Asperger's again at age of three. Uh, yeah, at three. Autism at age of three, and then oh my lord, uh, yeah, That's very rare <laughs> catching yeah. them that early. Um, yeah, and then. Uh, Asperger's at the age of twelve, so it was uh, so it's a, it was a really yeah interesting. Uh, it's been a really interesting life. I mean, it has been difficult growing up in a small town, but also dealing with people that don't understand and and on and onward. And it's uh, mm-hmm. my journey through mental health certainly has been an awakening over the last few years, realizing that you know I can't just. Um, put myself out there and out there and out there and take more and more mental energy without, you know, uh, experiencing definitely issues in, in a, in a, you know, and also being in a potentially hostile, not hostile environment, but you know what I mean? Like a toxic environment. So, uh, yeah, with certain things and stressful, yeah. not very inclusive, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's quite, 
interesting that you were diagnosed at the age of three because um, if, if it's not rude for me to ask, how old are you? So I am 33. I am right now, um, I've always lived here. I live on the farm outside of Woodstock, New Brunswick, and uh, I've lived here all my life. Um, my uh, shop at Bauma Woodworks, uh, I'm building a, the mi- military museum for the community of Carleton County right next to it. So, I mean, basically building on, we, we own about, uh, you know, 77, 78 acres land. So a good amount of uh, land oh. out in the country. And so, and then I've got my work and then I've got my autism work as well. Um, as uh, I was vice chair of the oversight panel for helping develop the national autism strategy, but I've been developed, I've been involved with projects overall Um before this as well, uh, the York University Autism Mental Health Project, the world, well, at least one of the first or if not the first um, autism uh, mental health guide for autistic people uh, developed by York University. Yes, that is in, a, in essence where things have gone uh, and have been what we've been working on, uh, what I've been working on the last many years. So it sounds like yeah, you're sorry. doing quite a lot of active work in in the community. Yeah, absolutely. We're trying to see consistent changes within, um, you know, the first world countries as far as you know, and in Canada, and the U.S. You know, we're we're now struggling with autism sure. acceptance and trying to push that forward. Right, we're trying to push that ahead, whereas. Mm-hmm. Autism, um, you know, awareness is, is old and out of date. It's uh, people are aware, uh, but they don't know enough about what it is still, even though there's over, you know, you said there's over 70 million of us. There could be up to 180 million of us worldwide. We, we uh, statistically sure, sure. setting, it's quite possible. I mean, when you have a population of uh, nearly, well, now over 8 billion, I think is what it was the last time I checked. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, with my involvement with stuff, I've also been involved in a smaller project, the Connect Group, which was a um, needs assessment survey for autistics in the Maritimes. Um, that was, and that's still an ongoing, actually, we're creating another section of that. So it's an ongoing project. Um, being in a, the Maritimes in Canada are more, uh, largely more rural but um, they're they don't have as many people, but they're kind of like it's Eastern Canada, and um, over seventy to eighty percent of us are underemployed or unemployed. It's just it's that's been mm-hmm. the current. It's it's quite similar in terms of like the UK. Even I think in in most places the rates of unemployment are really, really, really tough at the moment. Um, what I what I want to ask is like. No, because obviously you've been doing all this this great work within the communities and, and making some like systemic or, or trying to contribute towards a systemic change. Um, in t- in terms of like the military sound side of things, like how did you first sort of get into it, or how did you first like what why why do you think it's been such a, a large part of your life up until this point? Well, that is something that I honestly, for for me, it's been, uh, I started getting into like naval warfare and then air warfare and then, uh, you know, ground, uh, the, the ground operations when I was really young, like it started, um, grade seven and going into grade eight and then going into onward. Um, it's, it just grew from there. And then I, I got to, you know, for different stuff, I even got to meet more, you know, got to meet politicians of different ranks. And then wow. finally got to, you know, I've, I've been able to get involved in uh, politics with the Conservative Party of Canada and Conservative Party of New Brunswick, as I am today, and, and made connections there and then grew on kind of the work I've been doing. And uh, so... I do a lot of war history presentations at the schools. Um, I've been doing that for years, like First World War, Second World War, um, equipment, 
Cold War and up to modern. And what, to- what about the um, the 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 museum that you're currently working on? Like, because I know I know you've been talking about sort of like woodwork and sort of creating rep- like models and stuff like that. Models. Like, what yep. kind of what kind of scale are we talking about? Like, is it like these massive um, life size replicas, or is it like sort of different different models and stuff that you can display in in like cases? So. Uh... A lot of my models, like I've been building life-size rifle models, like different rifles, like from either war periods or modern uh, or modern times, you know, different, you know, uh, weapon systems that are, you know, life-size sniper rifles, different or different uh, rifles that have been used in different conflicts for numerous uh, years. And then I've, uh, since then, I've also built, started building tank small like one to 130 size uh like you know a foot to two foot long um scale model model tanks um howitzers um artillery pieces aircraft um fighters you know also stuff like say anywhere from um the spitfire world war ii spitfire mark one to all the way to you know then First World War F1 Camel. That's one one of the ones I just recently built. And then I've got stuff. Yeah, and then all and then also some ships as well. Warships. I built a model for somebody as a commission um, of the HMCS Bonaventure, which was our last in-service aircraft carrier for the Royal Canadian Navy. And that was uh, they were decommissioned, and the last one decommissioned. The Bonaventure was 1970s, and so I had uh, built that, and I'm planning on building more. Um, definitely. So I really branched out. I've even built model grenades to, yeah, different, yeah. So it's, wow. and then I, I started, um, get, yeah, honestly, like for me. My um my range of skills has always been like fairly limited and and one of the areas that I always used to struggle in was to do with history. And <laughs> I just have a really bad recall for dates and for like like plotting things on a timeline. So I, I've never really uh, apart from maybe reading some some books about on like orders and history and stuff. Like even even then, to be honest, if if I'm reading something and I'm learning about something, I don't tend to remember who it was or when it happened and where oh, it was. Okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I'm 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 absolutely rubbish with that, and I've I've also not really had no experience in terms of like woodwork or like sort of crafts that, that use your hands and like um i think the 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 one thing that i have ever created was in like a designing technology session at secondary school where i made this weird robot ladybug where you you pull it was like a coat hanger and when you put your coat on it the arms went up <laughs> like <laughs> very, oh, very, hey. very crude and um <laughs> oh, hey i mean everybody's got so skills that was, um yeah Everybody's got skills, you know, yeah, your, uh, you, your skills and other things. People are skilled in some things. Some people are skilled in other things. And it's like every autistic person is different with different gifts and different uh, abilities. And then definitely, and, um, I started building furniture too, which is great because then I, I started making even more money, um, is a tapping into a big market. Right. So, which is great. Like tables yeah. and shelving and yeah, that's really, it's really, really cool. Um, yeah. I feel like our skills are very um, different from from one another's, but we do have one common interest that um, I think we chatted about a little bit uh, when we did our pre-chat, sort of like the before before we sat down to do this podcast, we had a bit of a chat, and mm-hmm. um, you're telling me about your experience with martial arts, and I well, I guess I oh, would you be able to tell us a little bit about that? So my experience in martial arts, uh, it's really interesting because I've uh, just 
uh, the anniversary of my, in a sense, my 10th year of being involved in Kung Fu and um, martial arts. I do anything. Uh, I've done uh, numerous types. Uh, I've done Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I did that for four years. Mm. And then uh, the club, it's kind of going different ways. So, I mean, I did it for four years and then, so, but then I started Kung Fu the same year, which was in 2012. Did that for, uh, I've been doing that for over 10 years now. Wow. And uh, uh, yeah. my brown, brown sash now. So I've been, uh, you know, brown um, is next to black. And so, oh, they they tell me, as they told me a few days ago, if I stay committed, keep going hard at it this year, that I can be ready to test for my black yeah in the summer next summer i find it really interesting that like one of one of the only well, i mean kung fu is one of like the only martial arts other than perhaps something like krav maga that has um elements in it which are not <laughs> practiced elements in it that are not like legal in like the ufc for like mixed martial mm-hmm. arts and stuff mm-hmm. um because mm-hmm. i i think if i'm right Unless it's unless it's Wing, Wing Chun that I'm talking about, maybe. There's, Wing uh, Chun is like Kung things Fu. like eye poking and like. Yeah, Wing Chun is more close. Uh, so I, I so yeah. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Sorry. So I, I find that really funny. I mean, my my background is primarily in Taekwondo. Um, I've done I've done a little bit of other martial arts, but Taekwondo was the one that I took forward, and I've. I've always had like a really strong predilection for like full come cont- like sparring things like that. It's always been something that I've really, really enjoyed. Um, I've done a little bit of boxing uh, when I had my uh, bike crash in Thailand about God, like four years ago. The thing, the thing that, that caused me to go get this surgery that I've had recently. Um, I, Obviously, I, I couldn't kick very well. Uh, I, I did enter the national championships, British national championships, and managed to get a, two wins and get a bronze medal, which I was very pleased with myself with because I could not um, use my my right leg at all during that competition. <laughs> so so I, I anyway, I, I transferred to, to doing a bit of boxing, you know, uh, starting doing a bit of weightlifting, things like that. Um, I'm really hoping to get back into martial arts because it's always been like a really, really integral part. I find that exercise is one of the, the only things that really significantly reduces my anxiety and overload on like a daily basis. Yeah. And that's the, absolutely. I actually have done boxing. Uh, I've been doing boxing the last, uh, year I've been doing, um, um, a lot more boxing and different stuff for just, uh, punches, uh in different aspects uh my friend actually runs a new club in woodstock and uh we are doing we've done tremendously well um i've helped out a lot with uh we did the big champion well um uh, the big boxing day stuff uh bo- sorry boxing day the big um boxing uh card we had august 6th for uh our fair old home week and uh and uh, the four people that were fighting in our group um, all won. So it's a new young nice, club, nice. and it's they've done well, so well. I never, I never actually got into like boxing, sparring. Um, I think, like, I really want to, and I, I'm, I'm very much like a a brawler type of fighter. I quite like to 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 trade strikes and things like that. But I think I was just really put off by the um constant brain trauma <laughs> i think yeah. that was that was like a point where i think cause, you know i use my brain for a lot of things i i i you know for stuff around science if i want to get back in science i have to use my brain for podcasting for writing anything like that they all use my brain so i'm like i was always on like for that year that i i properly did boxing it was um it was always really, really on my mind and sort of holding me back from it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But I am, I'm considering going in and like 
Uh, there is a Muay Thai gym near me, and I'm wanting to. I'm I'm even wanting to go back into Muay Thai, go back into Taekwondo, or go back back into, or start start with Muay Thai, um, because although I, I I like the idea of boxing and Taekwondo because they're quite they're quite similar. One's just you kick and oh, yeah. one's just you you punch. Um, other than sort of the scoring system and stuff, but um. I feel, I feel like it'd be a waste to, to waste all my Taekwondo training and go into boxing. <laughs> like I can already kick quite well. So it's, um, it seems quite, it seems I think like it's, it's the right idea. I think. Yeah. I think it's certainly like Taekwondo is, is awesome. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, Kung Fu has been like basically the start of everything. And then a lot of other things have derived of, derived from that and uh yeah Mm -hmm. yeah um it really has a sort of a big impact on like like other areas of your life like it builds your confidence so much to to know that you can sort of defend yourself like you just like when people say oh i want to learn to fight to protect myself it's like in most circumstances if you are a good enough fighter you won't get yourself into those situations because you just don't, you don't react in the way that most people would if they like try to start like being hostile and being confrontational and stuff like that. Yeah. But it's, it's also like, it teaches you grit and like when you, when you put the work in and put all the physical, go for all the physical, um, torture and like <laughs> i like to say yeah. the word torture because it's it basically is that's what that's what it is but um <laughs> you learn all the techniques you you perfect yourself you know body wise and it also it really sort of builds all those like key um personality traits like grit and sort of determination and confidence and you know it's definitely been absolutely massive for me in my life so obviously you know today we're talking about autistic people during the ukraine war um i think it would be good for us to kind of get an understanding of what your role has been in sort of supporting autistic people during this really difficult time so i guess i guess what i'm saying is what what kind of work that you have you done with ukrainian families during this war so um i've been doing with limited resources that i have uh for long range uh, stuff i've in a sense i've been messaging like when i first started uh, this i've been involved with the open sourced because being involved with the military open sourced intelligence uh, which is uh say osint is os int is basically you know uh you can monitor uh, different channels like on the internet, like uh, radar, like the civilian radar sites. Uh, you can monitor the different um, uh, chatter from the ground, uh, people living on the ground to different uh, um, uh, official official sources to all the way to um, different sources and videos on the ground. Um, so when Russia launched the invasion of Ukraine in Febru- on February 24th, um shocked all of us but and i knew that there was going to be mm. there was going to be a need um for um because i know that there are you know parents of autistic family members that we were and i found out that there definitely there are more of them and i got involved with a group on um on facebook and and i've sent out basically some feelers you know like um as an autistic person, look, uh, how are you guys doing? Uh, are you guys looking to get out or come to Canada or, you know, and I got a lot of response. Uh, and I've been just, you know, helping them share links, um, sharing links with them about uh, the refugee um, operations and uh, trying to come into Canada, de- depending on the province. And it just, I... I've been hearing and know, and I've been talking to families. And yes, the the first priority, right, and certainly when the war was uh, not going as well, was food 
and um, and supplies and what food and water uh, and the mm-hmm. the aspect of supports for special needs was way down there because and it's unfortunate yeah. because they did not have and you have family members autistic family members that are overwhelmed um, scared some of them are in conflict zone some of them are in western Ukraine I had talked to more that were uh, had been in Western Ukraine and, and were leaving. Like some of, a lot of them had gotten to Poland and, or Czech, uh, the Czech Republic. And that mm-hmm. would have been a nightmare in itself, right? Cause you're leaving your home, you're leaving everything behind. Um, and for family, there's a lot of change, a lot of oh. transitions that they have to, to deal with. Uh, if you can imagine, you know, cause we don't like change. We, we really don't like change, like sudden change. I don't either. Uh, but can, if you can imagine the scale and the – it's just unbelievable. It's just – I don't know. Like especially for young children, that would be extremely hard for autistic children. And yeah. it just uh, – going into Poland where there's hardly any space left and then um, there's – you're seeing, you know, as sometimes in, in the conflict zones, you're trying to trying to get out, and it's very it's very difficult, um, especially areas like where it has been very tough in Mariupol, and um, and then you know areas like Molitopol that have been occupied, and yeah, yeah it's it it's been very hard on people and a lot of them have come to um come to canada and uh some of them have been able to come to canada like say toronto or vancouver or in different areas we've had more as well ukrainians in general coming to new brunswick i don't know how many that have autistic family members but honestly i mean i've done the best I can on with in the sense of the knowledge that I have. Um, But I've also been involved with this fighting Russian disinformation has been some of the main work I've been doing. I've been doing the, I've been definitely reaching out to families. Russian disinformation. Is that like, yep. Yep. Like things, things to do with autism or just to do with the war or just to do with the war, like the disinformation on, mm. um, you know, on Ukraine, on the Ukrainian, um, the lies of, of Ukraine, you know, against Ukrainian people saying that the, you know, they're there for Nazism and that, that this it, government is completely corrupt in with, and involved oh completely with Nazis. Yeah. And, and this is, was the excuse to invade Ukraine that Putin had used. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so this whole thing had been an ongoing problem. Um, lots of different um, stuff that they try to manipulate. We've been, we and me and many other people have been fighting against and holding spaces on Twitter and, some of those environments have also not been um, very autistic friendly, to say the least. And that's kind of burnt mm-hmm. me out as well a bit. And I've already been doing all this other stuff. And then with the museum, it's been I can imagine. a busy year. Oh, yeah. So you said that you were working with sort of like other people who were sort of trying to, I guess, I guess trying to support these families and these autistic adults and things of that nature. I guess what I want to to know is like, because obviously the, the state of autism awareness and acceptance and, you know, neurodiversity and all of that, it's, it's something that's very variable country to country. And I've talked to many people from different places like Israel and, um, Oh my god, I can't, I can't remember the other ones, but it's very, very variable uh, from from country to country, as as far as I can see, mm-hmm. and uh, it's not always a hundred percent sort of definite or clear, like depending on like how much currency they have or like things like that. And you know, places like Israel, I was talking to Doctor Mordi Benhamu, who was who's situated in Israel and they have a really, really good 
level of awareness and acceptance and inclusion and stuff. Um, so I, I guess what, what is like the state of autism awareness in places like the Ukraine? It's getting better, but I will say this compared to say Western Europe, England, uh, and France and, in in those areas, um, it is behind, definitely behind as far as autism and autism awareness. They are very, they're, they're still behind. They're definitely, um, mm-hmm. it's not their fault. It's just been, they, they're still a modernizing, um, Western, you know, Eastern European country, but with what, uh, modernizing with Western ideals. And that takes years, right? Because, being a part of the Soviet so, sphere of influence for so long and then coming out of that and becoming a democracy and then with all the internal politics that have been going on and there has been, you know, you know, uh, different changes in, in government. And then, you know, they, um, of course, they had uh, a, Rus- a Russian-backed president you know, before 2014. And then mm-hmm. uh, he was ousted and then they so, had a support of Ukrainian president, uh, national, more of a national, um, uh, president, nationalist president that was pro Ukrainian and the Russians didn't like it. So, and then they wanted to take back Crimea and they did, and then, and on onward and onward. And so autism has really been on uh, a back burner out of many back burners, but trying to modernize its Western thinking and that thinking doesn't just come easily it takes years um same thing we're trying to do in canada is modernize the thinking of uh, more peer autistic programs developed by autistics and nothing about us without us and much like in the uk and in the united states certainly yes um they there's a lot of things that that come into play and that's part of all the social dynamics that have to come into this. Mm-hmm. And so there's well, that. Well, what about, um, what about like Russia? Like, do you know, do you know that, do you know about like the state of autism awareness in Russia? Uh, it's worse. Um, Russian in Russia, it's, Russia's not in um Russia has not been um it's not an open society. Um I talking to one Russian yeah. earlier on in the war, there's no mental health support. There's no and worrying mm-hmm. about being different and, and especially if you are um if you are gay, if you are LGBTQ Putin does not like that. The government will go against that fully. And uh, people are being arrested. People were being uh, hurt. Uh, some were being killed. Um, that all, that's a minority group that is um, definitely oppressed in Russia. Um, doesn't matter what the people so I guess say. Like, yeah. It just, yeah. Because I guess like one of, one of the things that, you know, because, because we're talking about, like the effects of the Ukrainian war, like it's not, it's not, I suppose it's not only like civilian Ukrainians that are affected by this whole thing. It's, it's also the, the Russian Ukrainians. And I did get the Russian Ukrainians, (laughs) Um, the autistic Russians that are being affected as well. And I did recently did a sort of an anonymous interview on my Instagram and um, I was talking to this this um, this lad from from Russia, and he 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 was saying exactly the same as what you're saying. He's saying that all okay. like the um, provisions, like the the medication, the you know sort of the the general sort of um, attitude of like the government as as well as the people towards people who are diverse, whether it's sexuality, whether it's um, mm-hmm. Autism, where it's you know whether it's neurodiversity. Um, I mean, yeah. it's too bad, eh? 
it's just it's too bad i mean yeah. uh you think that you know after the fall of the soviet union that there's always this fear of trying to bring the uh the russians into a um <clears throat> into more of a modern uh way of thinking and uh a more western way of thinking mm-hmm. and a democracy way of thinking and and uh there's a lot of corruption that came in with that and then there's a lot of and there was corruption in the soviet era as well but also there was uh certainly russia um with vladimir putin you come into a man of the old way of thinking the kgb an old kgb style man way of, and a um ex, um exclusionist and uh nationalist russian way of thinking and um you know thinking that the west is the enemy and you know that's that same um expansionist and um soviet way of thinking if not czarist way of thinking you know um czarist in some ways i'm i'm not too too up, up on well, what Putin, that means one person has ultimate po- the ultimate power was Tsar Tsar Nicholas II and okay. his family were in charge when the um, the before the Soviet um, era took over in 1917 there was the Bolshevik Revolution and the uh, the Tsars were the, the Tsar uh, Tsar Nicholas II and his family were were taken out of power and the Soviet era became you know, at this uh, a socialist and, and communist rule. Um, yeah, one bad government lead to another, in a sense, just another form. Well, um, I guess, like, so obviously we've we've understood that, you know, thing, things are not looking great for autistic people. And on, on, I, want, I don't like to say both sides of the war because I don't, you know, I'm not like angry at the the russian people i'm angry at the people who are who are in power and i'm angry at the people who are forcing people to to go to war and and, and obviously there are going to be some russian individuals who you know they believe they believe what what they're saying and they believe the the people who are who are doing all of these actions that are just absolutely horrific and you know not not putting humans in the in the the best conditions um i'm saying i'm i'm sort of dan- dancing around it the 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 topic because it's it's such a it's such a um a horrible things that thing that's happened and I, I feel sometimes a little bit um i don't know you you i think there's a concept that you have around like survivor's guilt and stuff and i feel like mm-hmm. every every day that i'm going that I'm going to work, that I'm worrying about very minor first world problem things like that. That I'm, you know, I'm I'm not involved in in the horrible things that are happening and, and are happening at the moment. And it's 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 sometimes quite um, sometimes quite hard to speak about it because I I don't feel sometimes and very involved in it and i don't want to like speak for for people or i don't want to get anything wrong or like uh, i i just find that that the whole thing with war is that it's very messy isn't it like yes it's no, very very messy and that's you, the you hear things that's from, the thing from both countries yeah. from different perspectives different political spectrums it's so hard sometimes just to get a clear picture of what's happening oh absolutely and that's uh, that is a serious uh, that's a serious thing when war is going on there's it's the fog of war and that's um, and Ukraine is doing very well I mean you look at Kharkiv uh, the, the Russians have been pushed out of Kharkiv the one has collapsed uh, the Kharkiv oblast in the east and uh, the Ukrainians are counter um, launch, have launched a major counteroffensive in Kyrgyzstan. And they're doing well, and uh, the Russians are doing terribly. They've lost. Well, the Ukrainians say they've lost over nearly fifty-three thousand troops. Um, the 
Um, mm-hmm. The Americans well, and the British will say it's it's slower than that, but again, the Russians will say, "Oh, it's it, it's all fake news." And <laughs> so, I mean, but the Russians are doing terribly, and the Ukrainians are taking back their ground, and it's just it's that's good, you know. Yeah, it is. So, it is. I think um, you know, it's 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 an, an amazing thing, and I'm I from the news that I saw in the UK or on social media or anything like that, it seemed like it was, you know, a matter of weeks before like the the whole the whole Ukraine was was gonna be taken over and it's and we're gonna have to get all of the the NATO involved and like mm-hmm. it felt very, very 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 like it was gonna be like a really quick thing. And you know, that was months ago and it, it, it just seems to keep lingering by and you know, all of all of the the press and all of the media that's in, in the UK at the moment is it's all about like the Queen or like the celebrities and like it, it's it's really I understand I I, I get it. I, I get what nobody wants to hear about war all the time and horrible things happening. But it, it just feels a little bit disillusioning sometimes to know that these things are happening right now and we're all focusing on our own first world problems and first world news and like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, the queen is, uh, is certainly an exception to the fact that, you know, uh, such historic, she's so historic. She's, uh, her majesty, um, mm. uh, my thoughts and prayers are with the family, and and of course, Her Majesty was a big, um, uh, a big figurehead for you know the Western world, and not not just the uh, Commonwealth um, states and com- the the British Commonwealth, including Canada, but mm. um, all over the world. I mean, it just she was such a, a lovely lady. I mean, and I think that Monday I do uh, I'm in full uniform for. Um, the uh, funeral services with my legion. I'm involved with the legion as well. I'm actually their sergeant at arms, so I get to dress up and uh, with wow. the beret and everything, and uh, and flags. And uh, cool. so I, I guess you know we, we've talked about kind of like the state of autism awareness in um, Eastern European countries like Russia, like Ukraine, like in different different areas of the world. And we've also talked about, you know, the kind of work that you're, you, you, cur- you have been doing and, and are currently doing to try and help out autistic people during these really difficult times. Um, so I guess I'd, I, I want to be a bit more like specific, um, you know, from, from, cause you've been in contact with so many people and sort of taking this active, uh, effort, I guess one, what I want to know is what are the common issues that are facing uh, Ukrainians or, or autistic Ukrainians at the moment? Well, I can see that for one thing with everything going on, um, I mean, since the start of the war, it might be better now because Ukraine's doing better. More Ukrainians are moving back home, certainly into Western Ukraine. One thing I can think of right now is... Certainly the major disruption, like, I mean, if you can imagine the life, especially if, you know, you're more sensitive, if you're an autistic, that's more sensitive to uh, your timeline and your, and your, um, you know, your schedule, that being completely interrupted and things being interrupted on a major Mm -hmm. scale. um, You know, the, in the war zone, you've got a lot of, um, you know, threat to life scenarios, uh, including, you know, artillery shells coming down. You've got, so if, if you can imagine, um, if you're more sensitive to noise and your world being some, there are autistics in Ukraine that we don't even know about that their, that their world has been turned upside down. And that's not just, um, that's mm-hmm. talking about a minority within a community that's in that Ukrainian community's world has been turned upside down since February 24th. Um, the not only acts of genocide, um, 
and indiscriminate bombing and indiscriminate um, strikes with cruise missiles uh, with 2,000 pound warheads to and um, people being you know alive one minute and killed the next um, all that it's all that and in combination of needing to get supplies needing to and there's been enough especially in the major cities they've been well supplied um, with food and material which is great from the western countries and onward and, and different organizations but but it's worse in other areas um outside of larger cities say around in the east it has been worse uh it's ground has been more has been captured back now but in um areas in saltivka like outside of uh and outside of kharkiv and small villages that have been shelled farming towns and fields have been destroyed and so that's food disruption and it has been more desperate for getting food in for these smaller communities and if you can imagine autistics living in rural, in these rural communities it would be definitely hard plus all the stuff that they face in a sensory level to begin with and mm-hmm. so the there's that and then uh, that's what everybody has been dealing with. But as you know, you and I process things and feel things differently. So it can be more acute and then it can be more um, more difficult to, um, to function. And executive mm-hmm. functioning would be something difficult for some people, definitely if they're not with family and... And sometimes that can be contribute to life and death situations and it being extremely difficult. Um, so that is something that, and even so Ukraine, they didn't have anything. They don't have much of anything for autistic adults, except maybe in the major cities. And even that would not be, not be up to say Western standards at least that I know of. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean that I'm completely right. It means that, you know, their vast majority are still in that kind of sphere of awareness and acceptance is behind. And so, yeah. yeah. I, um, I think, uh, you know, sort of things that kind of spring to mind, like she was saying about sort of the, the the movements from from different areas of of the Ukraine to different countries and to different areas of or different other areas of the Ukraine, like there's a lot of movement and like I, I can imagine even for you know for for, for ASD one individuals like like myself and and yourself, um, like that that is such a such a a massive difference and it's not like they're going to places that they know it's not like they're going to another home that they have they're staying with people they're in you know i, I well, when i was watching the news i was, was seeing people who were outside and they were waiting to to get to get planes and to be transferred to different places and like like in 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 those conditions with with all of these these horrible things that are happening and the, the threat of like mortality it's such a it's i can't imagine just just how people how how i mean people in general but autistic people function in those mm-hmm. in those settings like transition wise um anxiety wise mental health wise you know they they're, they're not going to be accessing the the pharmaceuticals that they would usually have access to they're not yes. going to be they're not going to have available food that they that they like and that they usually have. You know, if they have conditions like Afrid, you know, they have Afrid. Um, can't can't remember what the acronym was, but basically, like medically picky eater, like no, having to, yep. um, yeah, yeah, not not being able to eat a wide variety of things, and um, yeah, like just th- those those two two in general just. If if I struggled with Af- Afred, 
our fid and if i know it being being as myself if i had to flee my home at the moment and there was there was a bunch of shelling going on and there was lots of difficult news and lots of um last minute changes to my massive massive changes to my life i don't know how i would would cope and like where where, where am i going to get the medications that are uh, which which is saving me like there's just so many aspects to it that i just i can't comprehend what it would be well, i can i can i can imagine but i can't fully put myself in that situation and possibly feel what those people are feeling like and if we're, we're speaking about the families you know if we have asd asd2 and 3 individuals who need that full time um, support and care. I, 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 do, I can imagine some of the children that I that I used to work with as a special needs TA. If if that was to happen, like they would, I, I, I don't understand how the families and how the individuals would be able to function on any level. It's, and I wanted to put out there. I have a friend who is a journalist in Kharkiv and uh, Sarah Ashton Cirillo. She is, um, she's uh, openly uh, a trans advocate and she's, she's awesome. She's a, uh, she's a minority um, um, within the, our sphere and, and whatnot. I'll just say that she's mm -hmm. an awesome autism. Well, she, she's an autism advocate as well. I mean, uh, but either way, like she's, open out things um she is a journalist an independent journalist in kharkiv and she's awesome like she's helped us on so many levels with open source intelligence but she's also helped so much of uh fighting russian disinformation in ukraine and she's she's been in the middle of this war um for over six months and she's still in Kharkiv, uh, oh my God. risking her life. And but she's done. And and there's no, you know how the big media, they don't like to. Sometimes they'll they won't show how bad it is, but they'll show it's bad. But they won't show mm. how bad it is. She, she doesn't put any filters in it. It's it's just she tells it like it is. That just she's one of the best journalists that I've ever seen. Um, she's she's awesome. She's uh, been there, and and so she's certainly been dealing with you know experiences of you know not having access to certain medications and and seeing you know that that aspect I can see as well for many many autistic Ukrainians. So that that experience um, is something where there's shortages on many levels of different things, and of course in the worst part of the conflict, you're worried about the basics. The basics are food and water, shelter, mm. and, you know, so there is so much, um, there's so many things that come into play there. I mean, imagine, you know, you're in the middle of the night, your, your area is getting shelled or with missiles again and then mm. again, and that's a, she's desensitized. To that stuff now. I mean, anybody would be that's that's living there, but Ukrainians are just going to work every day. They're going to um, eat at restaurants, even though there's no know another air raid. There's more missiles coming in. There's uh, so it goes to show the uh, inner strength of people. And when you try to break the spirit of the people, and the English know this very well because during the Blitz. They, they Hitler thought that you know it was going to break the will of the people by bombing and fl uh, firebombing London and major cities. No, nope, it made them more determined. And this is exactly what was happening here. So, yeah, it's uh, the the that's will really, of the that's people. Really interesting. Yeah, I guess you know. So the nat the natural you no know, question around this because we've 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 talked about like different aspects of um, autism in, in context of the Ukrainian war. Um, but we haven't really talked about like what, what people can do. Like, 
you know, obviously it's been going on for a while and um, it's it's horrific and it's, you know, some, sometimes we feel like we want to shy away from it and we don't want to speak about it. Mm -hmm. um, and other times we feel very, very passionate and we really want to help. I mean, I, uh, I, I, I know that, you know, when I was hearing the news on this, I wanted to, to do as much as I could, but, um, there was, there was a situation where I was talking to what I thought was a, um, Ukrainian person coming in to try and help. And then they, you know, I said, okay, well, I can give you enough supplies for a week or something like that. And then, um, it sort of took me to this dodgy website and like to transfer money over. And I was like, I, I don't know if this person is actually real anymore. And, um, yeah, I, I, I would, I was always looking for s something that I couldn't do, um, to actually try and help. So what is it that, that individual people can do and, and, um, I guess Western society can do to support, um, Ukra autistic Ukrainians during this time. What are some of it? Well, um, you can go on to, um, you go on Facebook. It's a big group. Um, uh, I just have to look it up. Autistics in Ukraine. So that's the autistics in Ukraine, the Facebook page. Yeah. It's a, there's a, a U for, uh, U a, uh, for Ukraine and uh, a for UA. Yeah, it's one. And I'm just looking at like there's different groups. Um, there's yeah. Okay, here we go. So there's the main group that I've been a part of, which has been uh, Ukraine Autism Help, and then it's in it's in Ukrainian. And there's uh like four thousand four hundred people on there. So there's different. Um, this has certainly been um something that has been an ongoing operation and there's different um there's different groups on facebook you can look at there's not just one specific one but um and i've been trying to my help i've tried to help some and which is good i've been in contact with family members that have contacted me uh, but i've also been kind of overwhelmed with all the stuff that's going on as well so i've been you know you don't want to limit yourself mm, but you can almost imagine. gotta like just yeah, it just you almost get because you got so much going on in your life, and then you kind of get burned out. And it's it's a lot. It's a long game with this. It's been happening for a long time. Yeah, this is a long game, not a not a marathon. This is or this is a marathon rather. This is not a sprint. The autism community um, can do more on these pages, and they can and they can get in touch with them. So I'm giving them the exposure so that people can get in touch with them which is great um i think that that's something that should sure. be out there and i like i feel bad in a sense that maybe i haven't done enough it's because i've got everything going on and then it just kind of and then with the doing the open sourced intelligence stuff you kind of eventually you get i mean it's not and it's not just that it's also the drama that comes with it. And unbelievably. So there is, has been some like on the, on the spaces, the Twitter spaces, which we operate, there's been, you know, trolls and then other people wanting, getting involved in this for, you know, trying to steal money or, you know, and it just, so, um, there's, there's all kinds of different strange actors on the internet. Right. So, that can is the kind of thing that mm. can burn you out too. I try to yeah, be careful yeah. because the spaces are not very, they're okay. They're not autistic safe enough. Like anybody can join and start trolling people, right? If you let them up and you don't know mm -hmm. who they are. Mm -hmm. So it's not as minority safe as it should be. That's just the Twitter spaces in general. Yeah. yeah. Long story short. What about, so you've talked about sort of in terms of an individual basis, you can you can get involved with those communities, maybe help them share their stories, maybe help them, I guess, maybe fun, fundraise for, for different supplies, you know, offer some, some advice, some support. Um, but I guess what, what could like, 
I guess the wider communities in Canada, America, and the UK sort of do to um, support them. And it has has there actually been anything that that has has been put out to transport these people? Um, to transport them well, they you know they've given like. Uh, Canada has definitely expedited people that have wanted to come to Canada um, early in in March, um, you know, to escape the mm-hmm. the fighting and uh, and and then some of those people now because the the uh, Western Ukraine is is pretty safe right now and uh, they are um, the Russians are being pushed back and uh, they're not doing very well. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The Ukrainians are counterattacking everywhere, which is good with the new equipment we gave them. So they're coming back into Ukraine, but there's different organizations you can, you can donate to. Um, there's uh, one of the biggest ones, like for the Ukrainian army, save a life. Um, and there's, I don't know about, there's different, um, organizations you can look at uh online that will help autistic ukrainians there's not very many of them but there are they do exist um i'm just trying to bring one up right now here and um so autistics for ukraine you can um there's been like different fundraiser events and uh expert speakers and whatnot uh, that can help help mm-hmm. out um there's been different uh stuff on zoom and you can get part of you just have to kind of do your 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 research and i actually have been sharing the guides the autism mental health guides um that york university and i and other people have helped create so and so that's been part of uh that's brilliant my, yeah definitely and uh, i i just have to say i i have the absolute utmost respect for you for for doing all of this for like it it can't be something that's that's easy like it, I imagine that it's quite hard on on you to kind of you know no, no for me I'm sort of going up my daily life I'm not really really thinking about it that much but for you 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 kind of actively trying to help and work and you know obviously manage different aspects of your life you know it's um, it's it's really amazing, like the support that you're you're providing these people, and like, I, I yeah, I just just I, I massively respect the work that you're doing, and 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 you for doing all of this. Well, thank you, I do appreciate it, uh, Thomas, and uh, we need to do another one of these podcasts because it's almost too much to unpack in one day. Yeah, <laughs> it could definitely be something that we. We have, a, we have a think about for the future. So, uh, I mean, this, you know, obviously this has been quite a hard-hitting episode. I, I don't have any any questions from Instagram like I usually have to kind of do a Q&A because I, I feel like it's enough to speak on this and I, 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 right. I, I feel like it would, it would just be good to kind of have a, a, a standalone sort of episode where we, we really talk about the the horrible things that are happening and and the ways that we can understand how what what it may be like for autistic individuals both in russia and both in the ukraine and also ways that we can actually as individuals help and support um ukrainian autistic people and ukrainian families who support autistic people I've been wanting to talk about this for a while, and it's it's obviously something that's incredibly emotionally charged. Um, and you know, I, I I feel the I, I don't, don't like wouldn't like to say that I'm I, I can understand the situation, but I I definitely feel I, I I want you know I want to help. I want to to do something and. I'm hoping that our podcast that we've done today has kind of illuminated some of the the things that may be happening, some of the the work that um, autism advocates like yourself are doing. And um, of course, if if anybody anybody who's listening finds this 
this episode quite hard to to digest and hard to feel about. I would always get in contact with um, any family members or friends to kind of uh, talk it out or like uh, different different organizations that offer support for mental health. I think it would be really good if you are feeling um, perhaps quite negative and overwhelmed by um, listen, listening to us talk about this the, these horrible events. Definitely, mm. definitely do that. I mean, us- usually I would I would end by doing the the Instagram Q and A, um, asking for like a, a song of the day. But I think maybe it might be quite apt to include the Ukrainian national anthem as as part of the playlist um i think it would be definitely definitely a good thing to do so i i will add that to the to the growing playlist the growing 40 ot podcast playlist that i have on spotify and you can find that in the links below and of course if you want to stay up to date with the advocacy work that i'm doing um some of the the blogs that i do on instagram uh, the YouTube videos that I make. If you if you what if you're listening to this, the YouTube channel Thomas Henley. Um, all of my social medias are Thomas Henley UK at Thomas Henley UK, and um, you can also uh, head over to my website uh, where I'm I'm starting to set up some some form of coaching business things. I'm looking to sort of go a bit more self employed with the the work that I'm doing so that I can do more of it. And um, of course, if you want to find the 40 OT podcast, uh, it is available on most podcast uh, streaming services as well as YouTube under Thomas Hanley. If you want to get in touch about what we've talked about today or do you, you just want to get in touch in general, um, at this this time, in this moment, my email is aspergesgrowth at gmail.com, but it is likely to change. It'll probably be something around Thomas Henley at thomashenley.co.uk, something like that. Um, but I will try to update it in the description if not. So yeah, that that that's that's all from me. I guess what I want to ask uh, you, Aaron, is do you have any any links or any any things that you want to share? Um, I know you've sh- shared a lot of links around uh, Ukrainian support and autism for Ukraine and things like that. Uh, but do you have anything that um sure so my um my um account on uh <clears throat> youtube is aaron boma a a r o n b o u m a and uh okay. so i've got a few subscribers as you can see some of my um my page you can see some of my uh model picks and and different stuff like that um and then all the the presentations i do on like the second world war first world war there's different stuff on there i haven't added stuff lately but i'm going to here soon um uh so that's so giving you a follow oh great excellent you've got me okay great um you you see the uh the the my front picture is of a uh wooden tank it's like a old first world war mm-hmm. tank. Yeah. That's yeah, it. Okay. Yeah. Very, uh, cool. Very cool. <laughs> so yeah. Um, also on Twitter, I'm at, um, at Canada five, six, six. And then okay. on, f- yeah, on Facebook, I'm Aaron Boma. Uh, and then, um, you'll see me in Legion uniform. Um, my business is at Bauma woodworks. Uh, B O U M A Woodworks, and on Instagram, I've got two Instagrams. I've got uh, at General Bauma, so that one is my main one, and then I've got the business one that is at Bauma Woodworks. So and uh, cool. yeah, so I've got a bunch of different. I will I will try and put as as many of those in the description as my. Uh podcasting allows my podcast service allows um, yeah but yeah i mean do you do you want to to, to say a few words to kind of uh, something that you want to say to the audience around this th- these horrible times or, or perhaps to um any ukrainians that might be listening 
So, to all Ukrainians that are listening, uh, know that we are with you and that uh, NATO and Canada and our allies are supporting you and that you will win this fight. And I'm, uh, I want all autistic people everywhere to know that, you know, um, the world's changing. I think it's changing. It's changing it forever slowly, but hopefully less and less painful and more and more open, at least to our um, to our thinking and to our, our beliefs and, and the way we function. Uh, know that me and many other people are working tirelessly to try to change things in society uh, for um, the autistic community uh, as a whole. And it is not, not easy. Um, know that uh you know i've been shot down numerous times uh and that's including trying to get into the canadian military but hey we are working to try to change things and i'm working to try to change things on a on a a level you know that uh that's innovative and and forward thinking and and many of us are, are involved in doing that um stay strong i want to encourage autistic voices to get out there And to, I know it sometimes for some of us, it's hard to find the courage to speak out because we are afraid of being judged. And I may be an extrovert. Some others may have a harder time doing that. Know that, you know, I'm here to help you and encourage you and Tom as just as, as Thomas is certainly. And, you know, and, uh, I really hope that we can do another podcast soon because this is um, this is really cool. Um, I uh, yeah, I've got a. We haven't even talked about working out because I do so many workouts and I was squatting yesterday and I'm sore <laughs> and it's just and it's just yeah, I know. Just, <laughs> uh, it just it's mm-hmm. great. Um, so, and thank you for having me, and I'm hoping to to you know. Uh, continue to work hard at what I do and hoping that people um, are encouraged and inspired to be able to um, push forward in their lives and, uh, and, and have the courage to keep moving even when times are tough. Um, I am hoping to have the museum open my museum open in, in, uh, Spring of 2023. Praying. I can get it done. Awesome. Very cool. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much for those words. And um, I think it's it's probably probably time to say, say our goodbyes. Um, thank you for uh, taking the time to come on my podcast and for obviously doing all of this amazing work. And um, to everybody out there, thank you for listening. Remember, get in contact if you 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 find this this episode quite hard to listen to, and um, yeah, hope you guys hope hope you dies. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> hope you guys are doing well, and um, I'll see you in another episode of the Forty Forty Podcast. See you later, folks. Take care. <laughs>